The Old Testament text for today is Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on the pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Please stand out of respect for the gospel. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So I have that rule about never preaching over 12 minutes, and I'm breaking that rule tonight probably. Um, I attempted to recreate in my own words a sermon that I heard over a decade ago that was the sermon that brought me back to the church after I left. And um, I really didn't think that there was going to be a time in my life where I came back, and uh, I did. And it just so happened that my mother preached that sermon, and so she's here tonight, so that one's, this is kind of a privilege uh, with that as well. This is also, those two texts are the ones that I did my master's thesis on, so whittling it down was a little difficult, but we're going to try to see what we can do. (laughs) So our Old Testament text for today, Uh, we meet up with the people of God while they're in the wilderness. 
For those of you who were here last week, we are essentially in the exact same spot. For those of you who weren't, I will recap. The people of God had been enslaved in Egypt, and they were freed by a God named Yahweh, whose mouthpiece was a man named Moses. Moses brought them out of Egypt in a miraculous event. They went through the Reed Sea together, and now they are wandering in the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. And the people begin to complain. They don't like the food. They don't really know where the rest of their food's going to come from or where the water is going to come from. I mean, sure, they were enslaved in Egypt, but at least they knew where their next meal was going to be. So they wanted to go back. Better that we're slaves than out here with you in the midst of the unknown. So in response, God sends snakes, serpents, to bite the people. Poisonous snakes. Some translations say fiery snakes. So the people that get bitten die. So the people realize they might have done something a little bit wrong, and they go to Moses, and they say, so we're kind of sorry that we spoke against you, and we're really sorry that we spoke against God, and we were wondering if you could pray to God on our behalf and uh, tell God we're sorry. And Moses does this, and God says, sure, but this is how we're going to deal with this. Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent, a, a metal snake, okay, and put it up on a pole, and anyone who's been bitten can look at that serpent, and then they will be saved. Interesting. By facing the symbol of their death, they instead find life. This is a very strange story, and it brings up all kinds of questions. And there's these questions about um, the miraculous healing powers of the metallic snake, right? That question's there, sure, but I don't, I don't think that's the important question. I don't. I think the important question is the God question. Is God just like that? Is God really okay with just sending snakes to kill people? Is God just condemning people for believing in something else? Perhaps to better understand what's happening here, we need to dig into some scholarly work surrounding this text. So first, I think we need to understand um, that this story is kind of just dripping with symbolism, that the early tellers and hearers of this tale would know and recognize. According to New Interpreter's Bible commentary, the symbol of the serpent was often used on the headdress of the pharaoh it probably represented the Egyptian protection god, goddess. Her name was Wajit. Wajit was said to have spit fiery venom at her enemies. The serpent was the symbol of the Israelites' death. It was the symbol of their oppression under the Egyptian empire. Now that system, that system was enslaving, not freeing. And if they confronted that, that, that serpent, that symbol, full on, it would kill them. I mean, God must have known that. If they returned to Egypt, Egypt was going to kill them. So God finds a way for them to confront this symbol and to realize that that, that would have just brought them death. And it, and it helps them deal with it. They can confront this symbol just a little bit by having Moses make the bronze serpent. It's it's kind of like a vaccine, where you take just a little bit of what causes the ailment and then use it to protect against the full-on disease that would lead to death. The people were then able to face the symbol of their death and instead find life. Let's put a pin in that story and go over to our New Testament text from John. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Part of the same religion that Jesus is, but he's kind of a head honcho, a big deal. He's one of the religious leaders. And he comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness, essentially in the middle, middle of the night so that no one can see him. None of his friends, none of the other people. And he comes to Jesus and he says, 
okay, okay. We know that you have to be of God because no one can do what you're doing if they, they weren't kind of in with God. This comes from the understanding that God didn't listen to sinners. Okay, so if you performed a miracle in the name of God, in the name of Yahweh, and it worked, that meant you weren't a sinner. That meant you were in this relationship with God. So Nicodemus is saying, we know that something's going on because God doesn't listen to sinners. So how do you do what you do? And Jesus says, yeah, okay, um, sure. I'm telling you that you have to be born again from above. And Nicodemus says, "Um, can you enter into your mother's womb a second time and be born? Nicodemus is completely missing the point. Um, Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus that he, he has to have an entire transformation of his lifestyle. Everything that he knows needs to change to the extent of pretty much having a new life. But how, how can he? I mean, let's, let's be fair. Um, Nicodemus is established. He's established in a way that very few people were. As a Pharisee, he's older. His family is of a particular class. They have a particular lifestyle. And Jesus is saying, you're probably going to have to change everything. And that includes your religious standards, your economic security. I'm talking about a complete and total transformation. I mean, could you imagine him just trying to stand up to his fellow colleagues? Jesus goes on to further explain, what is born of flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. I'm telling you that you have to be born again from above. And the spirit, it works like the wind. You don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it goes, but you feel it. That's what it's like. This will blow you in new directions, and you can't contain it. There's no standard, no system that can contain this, not even the religious one that you're part of and that I'm part of, Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't know where the wind was coming from that night that that kind of pulled him to Jesus, that made him have those questions and brought him there in the first place, this wind that was challenging everything that he knew, drawing him out of the role that he'd always been in. No religious system could contain this divine breeze. Even if he was one of the head honchos, this divine breeze, it's like the wind, okay? It's not set in stone. There are no set rules or regulations because sometimes doing the right thing or the thing that we're called to do and be for God means that we have to stand in opposition to what's popular or known or even what's deemed ethical or correct by a society or a religion. Maybe Nicodemus, maybe it means that you have to stand up for your beliefs even if your fellow religious leaders disagree with you. Maybe you need to come into the light and be a little honest about this stuff instead of visiting me in the middle of the night, covered in darkness and cloaked in your fears about what God may be calling you to do and who God just may be. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus all of this, and Nicodemus is not having it at all. Jesus is saying, you have to be free of these limits and these systems that are enslaving you and others and let go of them. But that freedom is too much for Nicodemus. What do you mean I have to change? What do you mean I have to be reborn? Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Obviously unsatisfied with what Jesus has told him. So Jesus brings it like this. He says, are you a teacher of Israel? You walk this land, right? like you're from earth. This is, this is where we are, because this is where God's working. Everything that I'm talking about is happening in your plain sight, right here on earth in this space. And if, we, if I tell you about these things that we're seeing right here on earth, if I tell you of these earthly things and you do not believe, then how could you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly divine things? And then verse 14 reads, 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So the next section of the third chapter of John is pretty popular, especially verse 16, uh, 316. I think that we often see it held up on signs at football games or perhaps scribbled on the bathroom wall somewhere. I'm kind of impressed at how many places I run into this text and how many different kinds of people feel that they need to tell me it over and over. Um, the famous John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Let's keep reading. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen in their deeds what they have done in God. So this section, in particular verse 16, John 3:16, has been used and abused more than probably any other verse in the Bible by modern-day Christians. It's like the litmus test of who's in and who's out. Who's saved and who's condemned, all the while pitting human against human as if we were the judge and not God. And it's funny because many of us think that we know exactly what this text means and what it's meant for, our, our, for all ages. We assume that our modern understanding must be the right one, I am guilty of this all of the time. But modern language and modern readers, modern culture and modern debates are not the same thing as those of the past. Marcus Borg in his book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, talks about this word believe. Um, we assume that it means to agree with an intellectual concept, okay, like a doctrine about God or about Jesus. And that is actually not what it means at all. The Greek and Latin roots of this word mean to give one's heart to. This is about an experience, something that perhaps can't be named, something that perhaps can't be put into a doctrine, something that you feel, you know, like the wind, like you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes, but you feel it. So to believe has nothing to do with believing in a set of doctrines or teachings about Jesus. How much brokenness and how much hurt has been caused by us Christians telling people that their lack of belief in Jesus would send them to hell? Oh, those Muslims. Oh, those poor Buddhists. How much horror has been caused by our human judgment and assumptions about what believing in God really means? And if it, if it doesn't mean that we believe in a doctrinal statement read on Sunday mornings, then what does it mean? If like the spirit you can't contain it because it's like the wind, then what? If, if like in the interaction with Nicodemus points to rejecting some of the standards of religious authority of the day, then what? If it's about a transformation of the heart and a coming into the light and a rebirth of self, if it's about that transformation and not about condemning each other or which religion is right and which one is wrong, then what? What if believing in God and coming to God is more dynamic than that? Limiting our understanding of what it means to believe in Jesus to the outlook of our time period or our, our cultural standpoint is dangerous. There are those that say, this is a good example, there are those that say, you know, if you Methodists really believed in Jesus, you wouldn't ordain women and you certainly wouldn't give your children communion. They may say, you know, if we believe in Jesus and their church and their church's rules the way that they see fit, 
if we follow those particular rules, that we will be guaranteed salvation. We will be saved even if those rules are patriarchal or racist or based in capitalism and hierarchy. But it doesn't matter because you'll be saved, right? <laughs> but this, this really isn't saving, is it? It's like Egypt. We know we'll be fed just enough to survive. Real freedom might mean that we are unsure if we will be fed. We may even have to take the risk and attempt to be faithful. Real freedom may bring doubt and sometimes fear. I wish it was easy too, my beloved. I really do. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like for me to be able to stand up here and say, okay, just do X, Y, and Z, and you will be in God's club. It's easy. It's so easy, and I'm 100% sure about my advice all of the time. <laughs> but that is not how I interpret the Spirit of God into work. It's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it goes, but you feel it. In the 31st chapter of the book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, good read, we find Huck in a moment of deep existential crisis. Huck has run away with a slave named Jim. Because of what he was taught in Sunday school and other things that he was taught about God, he believes that if he doesn't write his aunt and tell her where the runaway slave Jim is, that he will go to hell. Because you're supposed to do what your elders ask and what kind of like honor your father and mother thing. So he writes the letter. And he even feels this burden being lifted off of him because he knows he's doing the right thing. But then he keeps looking over at Jim, who's sleeping. And he keeps thinking of all the nice things that Jim had done for him and their friendship. And holding the letter in his hand, he considers his choice. I took it up and held it in my hand. I was trembling because I got to decide forever betwixt two things, and I knowed it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, all right, then I'll go to hell and tore it up. By facing the symbol of his death, Huck instead finds life. Jesus and that fleshly, churchy rules of the day did not save Huck and did not save Jim. But the spirit of Jesus did. Jesus calls all of us to come into the light, as scary as that can be sometimes, as disturbing as that might be to us, to come into the light, to be honest, to give up on old and oppressive ways, and to face our fears straight ahead. This process is much more than intellectual conversion. It's more than leaving Egypt. Because it turns out that being liberated from Egypt was much more than just walking away from it. Nicodemus never got his answer that night. He left deeply unsatisfied. He wanted an easy answer, and he did not get one. We don't really hear much about him again until much later. In the 19th chapter of John, we learn that he's one of the people to carry the bloody body of his Savior off the cross. Nicodemus faced the symbol of his death and instead found life and the courage to face his fears and to own what his heart knew to be true. And this is the good news. The Spirit of God will not be contained, not by any of us. Amen.